So if you have been with us over the past couple of weeks, well, last week, if you've been watching online and the week before that, we've been talking about it. We've started a series called Happiness Is. And I'm going to be honest with you. These last two weeks has been a test for my, for my perceived happiness. Now, I'm going to share some things. And I want you to understand that as I share these things, I don't want you... I'm not sharing them because I want your pity. I'm not sharing them because I want your empathy or sympathy. I'm not sharing them because I necessarily, I I don't want you to solve my problems. Okay? Uh, I'm sharing these things um, because I want you to understand something. Um, And it's interesting that God will oftentimes, and and, uh, earlier this week I shared with Pastor, Pastor Marcia and I asked her, to pray for me because sometimes when you, as a pastor, you go to preach something, uh, God's going to test you on that thing. Uh, So those of you who aspire to be preachers, be aware of this. God will test you on these things. And so God has tested my happiness over the last couple of weeks. Okay? Um, Okay. We got a lot of snow the last couple of weeks, and I, I, I've had a hard time finding somebody who would be willing to come, and I'm going to pay, I pay them for it, to come and shovel the snow. Um, I, you know, I, ha- I have somebody who will plow the, the parking lot, who will plow the, the office parking lot, but honestly, trying to find somebody who is willing to come over and shovel snow, because we got... We got a large sidewalk on this side of the building. We got a large sidewalk on this side of the building. We got a sidewalk that runs down this side of the building. Then if you go over to the, to the office complex, we have a sidewalk all the way around the office complex. All got sh- to be shoveled or, or snow blown. And then I go over to my house, and I have a large driveway that needs to be, to be blown, the sidewalk. Um, then I have the apartment who, that has a sidewalk that needs to be blown. And not once, not twice, three times. Happiness is a snowblower, yeah. I have these apartments. And, um, <clears throat> it, you know, with old houses, you know that they are not well insulated. And so the, the bottom two apartments, uh, they struggle in the wintertime to, to stay warm. And, and sometimes people don't cu- understand the concept of warm, keeping a place warm and keeping a place cool. Okay? So let me explain it to you. For those of you who do not understand, when you want to cool a place and it is 100 degrees outside and you want ideally your house to be somewhere between 65 and 70, you only have to cool it about 30 to 35 degrees. If you want that same temperature in the wintertime and it is, let's say, zero degrees, you have to heat it 65 to 70 degrees. It is a lot harder in the wintertime to keep a place warm than it is in the summertime to keep it cool. I need to remember that when I'm arguing with my wife about moving back to the south. It's just easier to keep a place cool than it is warm. And so I had actually bought for the apartment complex these two little gas heaters. And I plugged them up and, and got the gas lines to them and tried getting them started, and they just would not start, neither one of them. And I could not figure it out. Uh, I had uh, Stephen Crowley come over, and uh, thank you to Stephen and Eric and, and Pastor Stephen that came over and helped me do some stuff over at the apartment. But and he worked on it. He couldn't figure it out. Um, <clears throat> and it was like, Really, God? Really? 
how hard is it to get a couple of gas furnaces running? After that first snowfall, uh, that, that heavy snowfall, that really thick stuff that came down, I decided I was going to take Eli sledding. And I had yet to plow uh, the, or, or to remove the snow from the back, uh, the, from the driveway in our backyard. But I have a Jeep that's lifted that has four-wheel drive. I don't care. So I threw that sled in the back of the Jeep. Eli climbed into the passenger side. I climbed into the driver's side. I put it in, re uh, in reverse, backed up. Now, still in two-wheel drive. Backed up till I hit the snow, and the back wheel started spinning. I don't care. I got four-wheel drive. Shoved it into four-wheel drive. Backed out, no problem. Well, <coughs> because of the way things are in the backyard and the snow and everything, I couldn't go all the way back and then forward. I had to go back, forward, back up again, and then I could have gotten out. So I back up as far as I can, then I pull forward, and then I put it back in reverse. Nothing. Put it in two-wheel drive, put it in reverse. Tires are not moving at all. Four-wheel drive low, four-wheel drive high. Tires are not moving at all. Really, God? Really? Um, thank you, Ron. He saved, my, he saved the day. Because not only was the truck, not, the Jeep not moving, when I pulled it forward, I pulled it right in front of Jeanette's side of the garage. It couldn't go forward anymore because there's a garage in front of me. It wouldn't go backwards because the reverse didn't work. So now I can't move the Jeep and I can't get Jeanette's car out of the garage. Really, God? Ron came over and saved the day. We, he got his truck out. We hooked a, a, a rope up to his truck and to the Jeep and we pulled it out. We pulled it back far enough that I could get it back into the driveway, into the into the garage. Uh, thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Ron. About that same time, maybe a little earlier, we hop into Jeanette's car, and we decided we're going to head up to, uh, to Council Bluff. And uh, on the way back from Council Bluff, I hear this, this weird noise coming from the engine. Well, it'll be okay. We'll, we'll make it home. So, um, in fact, we were almost home. I think when I noticed the noise, we were already in Shenandoah. <coughs> so we go and we park in, uh, in the garage. And I says, you know what, I'll deal with it later. The next morning I got up and went outside, started it up, and still that was, there was that, that ticking noise. And um, I go and pop the hood, check the oil, and sure enough, it's a little low on oil. So I put a, uh, it took a full quart to get the oil back to where the oil was and um, where it should be. And I think this solved the problem. No sweat. It was, it was just low on oil. No problem. Um, next time I drive the car, back it up, and start driving. The ticking noise is still there. Really, God? Really? Through a series of events, I was getting to the point where I was not, I was, I was just, I had nothing perceivably to be happy about. And I'm preaching this message in, in, in that God wants us to be happy. Yesterday, um, I don't know if you guys, any of you guys uh, know this, but there was a house that caught on fire yesterday in Shenandoah. How many people knew that? Um, probably didn't know that it was a house right next to ours. The brick house that right next to ours. Not the apartment, but the brick house. And <coughs> um, so I'm in the backyard talking with one of the tenants, um, and we see this police officer with the lights flashing going really slow in front of the um, 
in front of us, in front of, on the road out in front of the houses. And uh, um, before, I, before I tell you that, I'll tell you this. I'm over here shoveling snow, getting ready for Sunday. Um, my third time, by the way, shoveling snow. Again, I'm not, doing, I'm not saying this because I want your sympathy, because I want you to solve the problem. I want you to understand my state of mind, okay? Shoveling snow around this building. For the th Luckily, it was only this much snow, and it, and it wasn't that hard. And I get a text from my wife, and she says, the thermostat... Uh, the, 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 the vents are blowing cold air and the thermostat is going down. Hey, uh, God. Um, Steve here. Hi, how you doing? Really? So I go home and I look at the, therm I, I look at the, the furnace for a little bit. And I, I figured out uh, that it was not running because of, um, uh, so what it does is your, th your, your, your furnace will try to kick on five times. And if it kicks on and then shuts off, it kicks on, shuts off, kicks on, shuts off, and does do that five, does that five times, it sends a code to your furnace, and your furnace just completely shuts down because it's not able to kick on. Um, I'm not an HVAC guy. I don't know what the problem is. So I'm frustrated, okay? Um, and I'm like, you know what? I just, need to, I just need to go outside for a minute. I went outside for a minute. While I was outside, um, I see one of the tenants. I go over and talk with them, and that's when we see the police officer. And next thing you know, I see a billow of smoke coming from the direction of my house. And I know the furnace isn't working. Is my house burning down because I did something to the furnace? I'm like, hold on. I run over there to the other side of my house where the smoke was coming from, and it was my neighbor's house. I am sorry for them, but I am relieved. Happiness is. I decided in the midst. I decided in the midst of all of that. That I was looking at everything the wrong way. And <clears throat> I had a conversation with God. And it didn't, it didn't mean that God didn't want me to complain about the situation. Every one of these situations that I, that I faced, um, did, it, it, it did not, from my perspective, it did not seem, and even after you evaluate, it did not seem that it was something that I did that caused these situations. And so I'm wondering... What is it? So, I decided that I was not going to allow situations that, are, uh, that, that happened within my life to dictate whether or not I was going to find happiness in this life because the happiness that God wants me to have did not rest on the situations that I found myself in. So, over the course of the, la the last couple of days, some, some things have transpired. Um, told you the furnace wasn't working, right? Um, I finally, uh, uh, after I realized my house wasn't burning down, um, uh, I knew that it wasn't a gas supply problem because we have a little gas fireplace in our living room, and I'm thankful for that to keep the living room a little warmer. Um, I went downstairs, and I did a little bit of research online, and 
Come to find out that one of the issues that happens when these codes come up is that your exhaust from your furnace can be blocked. Now, so the exhaust in, in my house, that, that, that come out of my house from the furnace, is this high. Okay, so, and I can see them. I mean, you can see them coming out of the house. And so I thought to my mind, well, that's not the problem. They're not blocked. They're above the snow level. God has a sense of humor that sometimes I don't appreciate. Um, yesterday morning, in an attempt to uh, clean up some stuff around the house, I had to make a path from the back of the house, which I had not done yet, around the side of the house. To do that, I had to remove snow. As I'm removing snow, I just throw it over to the left because I'm not like, okay, let's pack it right here. Pack it. I don't care. I want it out of my way, so I and throw it. In the midst of that, I threw a bunch of snow into one of the vents of the furnace. It's my own stupid fault. I do something stupid, and I allow my happiness to be taken away from me because I did something stupid. Now, that's just one thing that happens. The, the heaters. And, and all, of this, all of this really transpired after I decided that I was not going to allow situations to determine whether I have a happy countenance and attitude about life, I went over to the, the, the furnaces that I, the, the heaters, the, the gas heaters that I bought for the apartment complex. Did a little bit of work on them, did a little bit of research, did a little bit of work on them, got them both started. Um, Carl, thank you very much. I brought the car that was Jeanette's Honda that was making a ticking sound. Now, if you don't know anything about engines, one of the signs of low fuel, I mean low oil in your engine is it makes a ticking sound. And I thought that there was something wrong with the engine because of uh, partly the low oil or any other reason. I bring it over to Carl, and he takes a look at it, and, and he says, most likely... It's an accessory to the engine, a pulley or something, that is making this noise and not the engine itself, which is probably a several thousand dollar difference in fixing it. It is very easy for us, extremely easy for us, to allow our circumstances to affect whether or not we should be happy. And when we do that, we become the kind of Christians that non-Christians don't want to be like. If you're pouting all the time, you know what? Stop telling people you're a Christian. If you're complaining all the time about life situations, stop telling people that you love Jesus. If you always look like you just had a lemon sucked down your mouth, you know what? Don't witness to anybody because they don't want what you got. It's important for us to understand that the, the happiness that we, that we display we need to understand where it comes from. Uh, Oswald Chambers made this statement uh, in, in his book, um, in his devotional. He says, I thought God's purpose was to make me full of happiness and joy. And he goes on by saying, it is, but it is happiness and joy from God's standpoint, not mine. We need to understand that. The, if you are with us, you know that the Greek word for happy or for blessed in the Beatitudes 
is makarios, and that word indicates um, not a situational happiness, although it is included in there, but it goes way beyond just situational happiness. It is a divine happiness of knowing who Christ is and living in within that knowledge. That is the happiness. This type of happiness is given to us f from a divine. It's not given to us from each other or situation. It is given to us from the divine. One writer um, reminds us that, uh, of this about Makarios. These blessings do not speak of what a person should be or strive to be, but what they are. In other words, your happiness is not something you seek. It is something you are, something you already have. All here, this happiness that we have is contrary to the nature man, the natural man. Everything about it is strange to his disposition. It is only the grace of God in Christ Jesus which, which can, can produce this kind of happiness. We are happy. Not that we can be happy, not that we should be happy, but this, we are happy. Now, if we, after we understand this, it helps us understand the Beatitudes a little bit better. Last week, if you were watching online, you know I talked about the poor in spirit. Happy are the poor in spirit. And we discussed the poor in spirit being the, the spiritual destitute, the spiritual bankrupt. An identified poor is not just someone who has nothing, but also somebody who has no way of gaining anything. So spiritually poor is a person who spiritually has nothing and has no way in and of themselves to get it. Hence why the spiritually poor can be blessed because God is the one that can give them what they can't get on their own. And that is why the kingdom of heaven is theirs, because God gives it to them. But they can only give them what they, once they realize that they have nothing spiritually. Because once you think that you have something, you don't seek it anymore. Today we're going to look at the next beatitude. And, it, and it's in Matthew chapter, I'm going to read chap, uh, verses 1 through 5 of Matthew 1 through 4, excuse me, of Matthew chapter 5. And as we go along, we'll read more and more of this passage of Scripture. Verse 1 of Matthew 5. One day, as Jesus saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him. He began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. What does it mean to mourn? I think all of us have an idea of what it means to mourn. But unfortunately, we, we take all mourning and we classify it the same. And if you do that and you read this scripture, you misunderstand. Because God does comfort those who mourn. But what specifically is he talking about? Because I, I know people who, who have mourned in their life and never seem to be comforted. And if that's the case, then God's word must be lying. There's different types of, more, of mourning, and I want to I, I talk about, I, I'm going to put them in three categories to help us understand, okay? The first type of mourning is what we're going to call situational mourning. Situational mourning. Situational mourning is just that. You're mourning about a situation. You're mourning about a situation. 
Now, we see this type of mourning all throughout Scripture. Um, Genesis 23, 2. She died, referring to Abraham's wife, at Kiriath Erba, now called Hebron, in the land of Canaan. There, Abraham mourned and wept for her. Genesis 32, 7. Uh, Genesis 37, 34, excuse me. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His son that he thought had died, he mourned a long time. Nehemiah 1, 34, uh, 1 3 through 4. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. All of these instances, along with all of the other ones that we see. We don't, I mean, you, th you think of Mary and Martha mourning over the death of Lazarus. Uh, uh, um, you think of... Uh, Mary mourning the crucifixion of Jesus. I mean, you could go on and on and on about situational mourning. And everybody faces this, whether they like to admit it or not. Everybody faces this. There's a situation that happens, and you aren't happy with it. You don't like the outcome, and so there is this, this, this mourning. Now, the mourning that is, is identified by Jesus that is comforted is not just everyday mourning. It is extreme mourning, usually associated with the loss of a loved one or some great tragedy, as in Nehemiah's case, where he heard that the, the walls of Jerusalem and the gates of Jerusalem have been destroyed. A great tragedy and so there is this lamenting, this mourning that takes place. And we all experience this. If you have lost someone close to you, you've experienced this. If you've had a situation, I think of, uh, of the neighbors yesterday, and um, as, as their house was burning, if you don't... If, if, KMA did a little excerpt on it, and it was an attic fire, an electrical fire that started in the attic, um, and uh, their kids ran out of the house in their socks, and for the next several hours, now their kids actually got picked up by a friend and were, were taken somewhere, but for the next several hours, they were standing out in front of our house, not uh, across the street, just watching their home burn. If they haven't already, they're going to be mourning. Probably when they laid down their head last night, and it was not in their own bed, in their own house, mourning started, if they hadn't already. Situational mourning of great tragedies that happen. We all face them. We all deal with them. This isn't the morning that happens when something negative. I'm going to be honest with you. When, 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 uh, when my furnace went out yesterday and the house started getting cold and my wife told me about it, I was like, huh. It wasn't a lot of mourning as much as disappointment, a little bit of sorrow. This is not what this is. This is deep anguish. This is a crying out to God or to anybody who will listen for that matter. This is severe, but it all is based on a situation. And that's the first type of mourning, situational mourning. The next type of mourning is what I am going to call sinful Morning. And there's a story in the Bible that, that we see a lot of this sinful morning going on. 
and is actually surrounded by, around King David. King David in, in, in 2 Samuel, I mean, 2 Kings, we see that his son, Ammon, um, his son, Ammon, and this is a really, if, if anybody thinks there is not some crazy things going on in the Bible, does, they do not know this story. Okay, so grab your chairs. You ready for the ride? There's this, there's this son of David named Ammon, King David. This is, this is straight out of Jerry Springer. No lie. And he is lusting after his half-sister. Same father, different mother. He is lusting after her. And the Bible tells us that, that, that he mourned over the fact that he could not have her. He mourned over it. This is not, this is not a godly mourning. This is not a mourn. It is a mourning over a situation, but it's not a situation that, um, that he has no control over. He is mourning over sin. It is a sinful type of mourning. He's mourning because he can't do something wrong. Well, if you know the story, you know what happened. That he has a, he has a, a friend who t tells him how he can, he can uh, fulfill this lust within his life. And he does. He gets his sister Tamar, or half-sister Tamar, to come over and, and feed him. And he takes advantage of her. And then, it, interestingly enough, after he fulfills the lust, he is no longer mourning over her, not being able to have her. Now he despises her and sends her away, which is very disgraceful. That's not even the end of the story. David, King David, finds out about it. And you know what he does? Absolutely nothing. I do believe, although the Bible doesn't say, I do believe that he mourned over this situation. Because listen, it is his daughter that his son just took advantage of. There's another son of David who just happened to be Tamar's brother. His name, Absalom. Absalom, at first, keeps quiet, doesn't do anything. But then, and I believe, there, is a, there was a mourning that, go, that went on with Absalom, uh, although I think his mourning didn't last very long because he was planning revenge. For two years, he did nothing. And then he celebrates and has a party and invites all of his brothers there. And as all of his brothers show up, he has his, his sister's uh, rapist, if you want to, for lack of better word, killed. So Absalom has his half-brother killed because of what he did to his sister. As a result, Absalom, Absalom flees. Um, and it, 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 I don't have time to get into the whole story, but what we read toward the end of the story is David mourns the absence of Absalom. Absalom. He mourns his absence, his absence within the, even though he did an evil thing. This type of mourning that we see in Amnon and we see in David, David mourned, but you know why he mourned? I don't think he mourned necessarily because of any specific thing as much as I think he mourned because of the consequences of his failures. 
He didn't do anything to Amnon after Amnon raped his half-sister. He just let it go. And then he was more concerned about Absalom's exit from the kingdom than he was the kingdom itself. Because we'll find, you'll find if you read the whole story, that David has to flee Absalom. He left the kingdom. There's another, there's a story in the New Testament that we, that we see, and we are all familiar with this story. It's the story of Jesus' betrayal. Not his denial, but his betrayal. His betrayal of Judas. Judas mourned. But what did his mourning produce? What did his mourning produce? Self-murder. He was so sorrowful and distraught about what he had done that he killed himself. I think that a lot of us have experienced sinful mourning. Whether it is we mourn because of something that we can't do, or we mourn because of a situation that happened that we could have prevented, but we chose not to do anything about it. And now we're, in the, we're, we're mourning because of this evil that we allowed to flourish. There's another type of mourning. And this, is, this type of mourning is, I, I'm going to call it soulful mourning. Soulful mourning. It is a mourning that is deep within us. And it goes beyond our, our physical circumstances. It goes beyond our physical decisions. It goes beyond our interactions with other people. It is a deep, within the soul mourning. And it only comes, it only comes from a mourning over sin. There are a couple of places that we see uh, this, this, this mourning take place. Uh, if you read uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, and I don't, I don't have time to turn there, but read Isaiah and Jeremiah, you find that they are mourning, this is a soulful mourning over the sin of the nation of Israel. And, the, and not so much the consequences as much as it is the sin that we see within the nation of Israel because it's offensive to God. We see this soulful mourning in Matthew chapter 26, verse 27. Let me go ahead and read this, and you'll recognize it. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you ever know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. I don't... It, it doesn't specifically say, but I'm willing to bet he wasn't, he wasn't mournful just because he denied Jesus. I think that was worth mourning, but there was something deeper within his soul. A mourning that was down deep inside of us, that was down deep inside of him that he had gone against God himself, the words of God himself. It was, a, it was a mourning over sin that he saw within himself. And if you are, if, if you are a believer, if you love God with all of your heart, 
you have experienced this type of mourning, this soulful mourning. Sometimes, but, but not always, it is, it is seen by other people. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes, sometimes for people who are not emotional, and I, I am kind of non-emotional. I mean, that's just how God made me for whatever reason, except for when I stand up here and cry in front of all of you guys. Um, things sometimes that go on deep inside of me, most people don't know about because there's no outside, but there's still something that goes on. And then sometimes there is an, an, a, a visual, uh, there is something visual that happens, a display, a physical display within people that others see and yet is very surface. It, it hasn't reached their soul. And it is that soulful mourning that Jesus is talking about when he says, Happier are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So we have to ask the question now, we have to ask the question now, um, when, when, when Jesus is talking about mourning, is he including all of these? When he says, happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, is he talking about all of these? Well, I would propose to say no. And here's why. Situational mourning, mourning about a situation, does not require repentance. Repentance. And, and why is that? Because situational mourning, for the most part, is just you are in a situation and that you did not cause, and you are having to, to fight through this situation. There's nothing really for you to, to, uh, to repent of, because you, did, you didn't necessarily do anything wrong. Consider this, um, driving down the road in your car. And all of a sudden, a deer decides to jump out in front of your vehicle and you hit him. Are you going to mourn the fact that you just hit a deer? Now, some of you will mourn the fact that you killed a deer. And some of you will be happy the fact that you killed a deer. But probably most of you will mourn at some, at some way, mourn the fact that you just ruined your car. Or how about the loss of a loved one? Did you kill them? Did you put arsenic in there? Did you pull out a gun? You, you were, were in no way the cause of their death, and yet there's this severe mourning that going, that's going on within you. And some of those people are never comforted. And I believe they are never comforted because if they, if they were never comforted, God's word must be lying to us. Unless we understand what, it really, what really Jesus is talking about when he says mourn. And God would not comfort sinful mourning. And here's why. Because if God was going to comfort you in your sin, you know what you would, you would think? That what you did was okay. And God is not going to condone sin by comforting. Now, if you are repentant, truly repentant, He will comfort you even though you have sinned. But that type of, that type of comfort can only come when our soulful mourning is part of who we are. Soulful mourning will always, 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 always lead to repentance. 
an author, Gary uh, Gard Gardner Springer, said this. It is one thing to mourn of sin because it exposes us to sell. It is another thing to mourn it because it is an infinite evil. So are you mourning because hell is there? Or are you mourning because sin is an infinite evil? One thing to mourn for it because it is injurious to ourselves. You mourn, you mourn sin because it hurts you. It is another thing to mourn for it because it is wrong and offensive to God. It is one thing to be terrified, another to be humbled. Not only is this soulful mourning a mourning over sin, it's a mourning over sin the right way, for the right reasons. We are not mourning over sin because we got caught. We are not mourning over sin because we're scared of going to hell. We're not mourning over sin because we want something better for our lives. We are mourning over sin because our sin is displeasing and offensive to God. Not just displeasing, it is offensive to God. Have you ever had, have you ever had to watch something that you felt was offensive? It's not pleasant. And if you had the power, you would remove it from your sight. Guess what? That's how it is with sin and God. And God, it being offensive to him, will remove it from his sight. The only reason he allows you to not be removed from his sight when you sin is his love for you and the sacrifice Jesus made. Soulful mourning. And that is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. It's not a situational mourning for these situations that we find. It is not sinful mourning because of an unrepentant heart. It is soulful mourning, a mourning in our souls that comes when we realize, and this is the key, when we realize our spiritual poverty. All you're going to find as we go through these, all of these are tied together. We mourn, we mourn not because of the bad things that happen. We mourn not because we see something we shouldn't have seen or we experience something we shouldn't have experienced. We mourn because we realize, get this, we realize that we are spiritually poor. Being spiritually poor, you realize that you're spiritually poor, because I talked about that. It wasn't the people who were spiritually poor who got the kingdom of heaven. It was the people who realized that they were spiritually poor. Because everybody, everybody is spiritually poor without Christ. Once you get Christ you realize that you're spiritually poor. And those who realize that they're spiritually poor, they get the kingdom of heaven. But something else happens. When they realize they're spiritually poor, they mourn over their spiritual poverty. Guess what that leads to? Them being comforted. There's a lot of people, a lot of people, who mourn and are never comforted. But every person who mourns over their spiritual poverty will be comforted, guaranteed. But you can't mourn over something you don't realize you don't have.
This soulful mourning is a sign of our brokenness or the pain that we face. I, I really love this, um, and I don't know who the author was. It didn't say, but I'm going to read this because I like it, and maybe you can get something out of it. There is purpose in our pain. And he's actually talking about uh, mourning in, in Matthew 5, verse 4. He's talking about that when he says this. There is purpose in our pain. God never wastes our pain. In fact, there is blessing in our pain. I was re recently minded in a devotional that God blesses the broken. When Gideon broke the pitchers, the hidden light began to shine. When the poor widow broke the seal of the oil, God multiplied it and met her needs. When Esther broke etiquette and protocol, risking her life, God saved the nation. When Jesus broke the five loaves, he fed the multitudes. When Mary broke her alabaster box, the fragrance filled the room. When Jesus was broken by a crown of thorns, nails, and spear, the blood was poured out that cleansed us all from sin. God blesses the broken. Are we broken before God? Or are we satisfied? Do we continually mourn our empty state without God? Because once we think, once we think that we have something apart from God spiritually, anything at all, once we think we have something apart from God spiritually, we are no longer recognizing we are poor and we will not be mourned. We will not mourn for, that situ for, for our brokenness, for our emptiness, for our spiritually poor selves, and if we are not more, if we do not mourn, guess what can't happen? We cannot be comforted. Here's the, here's the, here's the, 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 the best part of all of this, and I'm going to ask Sarah to come on up here. We're going to have a, an altar time. Here's the amazing part in all of this, and that is when we reach the right type of mourning, that soulful mourning, when we reach that point, you know what God does? Not only does He comfort us in our soulful mourning, because this soulful mourning leads us to repentance. And when we are repentant, God can deal with our sinful mourning. And when we are repentant, God can help us and comfort us in our situational mourning. But if we don't start with a soulful mourning, the other aspects, we have to rely on ourselves to, to find comfort and as a result to find happiness. If you have never wept over your sinfulness, I, I, I don't like making absolutes because I know how, how bad absolutes are. But if you have never wept over your sinfulness, maybe you don't fully understand it. Because everybody that I read about in the Bible who understood their sinfulness wept over it. Peter, Paul, Abraham. I mean, the list, even Jesus himself wept over it, and he didn't even sin.
going to, Sarah's going to lead us in a song. And in, the, in this song, one of the lines it says, I want more of you. I want more of you. Here's the thing that we have to realize. Most of us have very busy lives. We have a plate full of things. Not only in, our, in things to do, but our minds are completely full of activities, of thoughts, of concerns. You want more of God? You know what he's telling you? Maybe you need to remove some of the stuff you have there and make room for him. I don't have time to go to church. Maybe you need to make more time to go to church. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time. I don't have space. I don't have throw in the blank, fill in the blank. Yeah, you don't have. Well, maybe it's time to readjust and rethink your life so that you can get some of us, some, some people just don't have more God because they just have not made room for him. And that is why some of us are experiencing mourning and are not being comforted. Because we've lost the soulful mourning that God desires from us. So as she starts singing this song, I'm going to open up the altar. And I, you know, I don't, I don't know everybody's situation. Okay, I don't know. I, I do know some of you are mourning over situations that are out of your control. You want something, something godly. This is, it, it, it's just something God wants you to have, and you're mourning over that, and you need to be comforted. Start with the soulful mourning. Or maybe, maybe you're dealing with the loss of a loved one. Maybe you're dealing with the struggles of trying to make it as a single parent. God wants, God wants to help you. He wants to comfort you in that. We've got to start with the soulful mourning. So I'd encourage you, as she leads in this song, if there's any type of mourning in your life, any type of mourning in your life, don't think that God doesn't want to comfort you in every aspect of your mourning. But he wants to start with the soulful mourning. It says, God, I have nothing. And I'm relying on you to supply my spiritual wealth. And he starts there. And he reaches every other aspect of your life. So join me at the altar as she begins to pray. And let's seek God for comfort that only he can give. No place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. Here in your love. Here in your love. There's no No place I would rather be here in your love, here in your love. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more, 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 oh 
would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. Here in your love, here in your love. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. Job chapter 42, I, I read this earlier, I'm going to read it again because I think it, it, it teaches us something very important. It said, then Job replied to the Lord. I want to set the background real quick. Job was a righteous man. God allowed him to be tested. Everything he had was taken away from him. Every possession, his children, even his health, everything was taken away from him. And he questioned God. And God answered him, and Job's response was this. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no one can stop you. You ask, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, and I was uh, talking about things I knew nothing about, things too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about them, about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said. And then, he, and then he says this, and I sit in dust and ashes to show 
my repentance. Job didn't do anything wrong. If anything that could, he could be accused of, and this is what God accuses him of, is questioning God's wisdom. And so to show his repentance over questioning God, not any actions necessarily that he did, he just questioned God. Over, the, over his repentance, he sits in dust and ashes. I think some of us are very quick to say in our mind, God, I, 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 I repent, I'm sorry. God, I, help me. God, we're very quick to do it mentally, but then we fail to, to, to show it physically. I don't do an altar call to make myself feel good about a bunch of people coming here. Because I know that God could meet you where you are in your seats. He's a powerful God. He can do everything he wants. But one of the things the altar does, one of the things the altar does, it gives a physical response to an intellectual decision. With Job, I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Now, it could very well be that we could leave here after spending time in the altar and change nothing. The altar is not magical. God is supernatural, and he works in people's lives. The question is, after he reveals himself to us, after he shows himself to us, what are we going to do now? I've said this before, and I'm going to close with this. Sin, the committing of sin, the, the evil thoughts, the evil words that people say does not, is not what separates a Christian from a non-Christian. It's not what separates a disciple of Jesus from a disciple of Satan. Those things don't separate us. Because we all do it. We all have evil thoughts about others. We all say things we shouldn't say. And we all do things that displease God. Christian and non-Christian alike. What separates us is how we respond to those situations. The non-Christian, I also I made a mistake. Big deal. I'll do it better next time. The disciple of Jesus, who loves God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, mourns soulfully. And that repentance brings a change in action. We don't change in action because we're trying to earn God's approval. We change in action because we recognize God has done something in us. So what are we going to do now? I want to encourage you to take the day and reflect on soulful mourning. Do you really mourn soulfully? And this is, this happiness that we get, it's not a temporary thing. It's a permanent thing. And it's part of who we get to be. It's our characteristic as servants of God, as followers of Jesus, as disciples. So let's, as I close in prayer and we get ready to leave this building and go about our days, Let's remember who we are. Remember who God is. And celebrate our soulful mourning and what it produces in our life. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you that you do care about us. 
as with Job, you are patient with us and sometimes call us out. But you do that so that we will recognize our need for you, that we would recognize that we are poor in spirit, and this poorness in spirit will bring us to a place of mourning, a soulful mourning, where we can be comforted. And that's your desire to comfort us, our soulful mourning, our, our situational mourning, even our sinful mourning, when we realize what it really is. You comfort us in that. Help us to leave this place comforted and, and stay in that. We can't do it without you, God. We need more of you. We ask this in your name and give you all the praise for it. Amen.